I just am so tired of this battle. You have no idea. Well, it's interesting how BSL was introduced in Ontario because it was introduced by the Liberal majority government. Michael Bryant was the Attorney General. And it was a reaction to a, a, you know, a few really high profile and, um, and quite scary dog attacks uh, on individuals. There wasn't a lot of science behind it. There wasn't a lot of real investigation behind it. It was kind of knee-jerk response to, oh, we got to do something, here's what we'll do. If you had a so-called pit bull type dog in Ontario in 2005, you had to spay or neuter it, um, and it was grandfathered in. Um, any dog born after, I think it's November 29th, 2005, that is born looking anything like any of those dogs is automatically eliminated. I went, oh my God, I mean, my dog was, 14 years old and had been the best family dog we'd ever had. And I had to put a muzzle on what would be a 95-year-old woman. You know, this, this girl was um, uh, the mascot for the boys' baseball team in the park right by us. And I had to stop uh, taking her to the park because the muzzle was too difficult for her. And this affected all dog owners in Ontario, uh, hiding their dogs afraid their dogs are going to be seized and killed, muzzling them, getting $10,000 fine without a muzzle. It, it was a, a horrendous thing that really happened to people overnight. What BSL means right now in Ontario is if you have a dog who has, and this is the way this horrendous law is written, short hair, broad snout, pointy ears, long tail, broad shoulders. I said it describes most of the male members of parliament except for the long tail, and how would we know? They wear trousers, right? I mean, it's such a general, descriptive law. It's so badly written that, for example, Labrador retrievers are covered by it. All sorts of dogs are covered by it. I mean, obviously, if you have a lab, you can prove, maybe you can prove, that it's by DNA a purebred, but if it's a mix, you can't. So, uh, you know, lots of dog owners who don't even know that their dog is illegal, you know, walking around the streets of our city, and all it takes is somebody who doesn't like them to turn their dog in, and then they'd have to prove the dog is not a pit bull. So basically, you're guilty until proven innocent under this law. Um, and not only that, the enforcers of the law can come into your backyard when you're not at home. They can take your animal when you're not there. They can do what police can't do with humans. And it can be a nightmare for people who love their animals and who love their family pets. I had a blissful ignorance about pit bulls when I used to use those words. Um, when I came into my, my now husband's life, Michael, Michael had a dog, Bella, and uh, we were dating for several months before he was in a near fatal accident. And I went from going for walks with him and his dog to all of a sudden he couldn't walk for several months. And I was solely responsible for walking this dog because we'd moved in together. And I'd never had a dog in my life. I was, I didn't dislike dogs, but I wasn't a dog person. I'm just an animal person. Um, so we sort of really had to bond and develop a trust fast, um, which came quite quickly because she was very, very well trained already. She's, she's always been a very obedient dog. But um, I worked in human resources and I went to a professional conference in Toronto where they were asking as a sort of an icebreaker exercise to talk about your family. And I didn't have a, a human baby yet, so I talked about my canine baby. And someone said to me, oh, what kind of dog is it? And I said, oh, it's Pitbull. And the entire energy of the room changed, and a couple of people actually sat up really straight and stiff, and I thought, what have I said, you know? <laughs> and I came home and I said to Michael, you know, I, I told him today we had a pit bull, like, what's the big deal with pit bulls? And he said, do you really not know? I said, no, what? Like, wh what's the problem? He says, Google it and see. So I did, and I was sort of given the impression that I was gonna find all these horrible things about 
pit bulls. <laughs> Here I go, getting emotional. And uh, instead, I found the horrible things that people have done to them and how sad it is that people have taken out you know these the laws and the treatment of these dogs so unjustifiably because you know I lived with one and at this point I'd lived with one for almost a year and I saw what an amazing soul she was what an you know an innocent sweet dog she was just like any other dog to me she was just like any other canine dog there's no difference with her and any other dog so to see what people were doing to these dogs and whether it was training them to fight whether it was them being euthanized because of the label and the misconceptions it really really hurt my heart and it made me upset clearly but also very angry and I thought what the hell is wrong with people like what are we doing to these dogs and that is literally what inspired me into activism my dog is fantastic with my daughter. They're best friends, they're inseparable. Bella has actually been quite protective of Sydney on some occasions. It's very important as a parent that you teach your children how to behave responsibly around your own family dog. There are a lot of incidents with dogs and injury that occur in the home with family pets. And that can be because children are left unsupervised with dogs, which should never happen. It can be um, because children are initiating behaviors that they have never been told are not okay, whether it's tugging on a dog's ears or poking it in the eyes, you know, how much would anybody like that, right? Eventually the dog possibly may react to that. When our daughter was learning how to walk, <laughs> we had to teach her to steer clear of Bella for a while because she was stumbling and falling down and we didn't want her, we used to tell her, you know, don't go near our Bella's bed because she could easily just topple over and fall on top of her. <laughs> now that did happen and Bella didn't react, but you know, that stemmed from us keeping an eye and, and realizing, you know, this is something that we have to keep an eye on and, and make sure it doesn't happen. The ideal future for me is obviously that BSL is reversed. I always say that uh, my own sort of personal tagline is that while I may not see BSL repealed in Bella's lifetime, I sure as hell will see it repealed in my lifetime. And <laughs> my, my perfect day always entails going with Bella to the beach. She just loves being in the water. She loves swimming. And it's my absolute dream to just be able to drive her safely across the country out to BC and to let her just run in the ocean. And I really hope one day we can make that happen because she deserves it. She's such a good girl. And that's what she deserves as a dog, as a good dog. It doesn't matter what she looks like. Hey, baby. A pit bull is, a tr is an umbrella term for a group of dogs. Uh, in Ontario, it includes the American Pit Bull Terrier, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and the American Staffordshire Bull Terrier. It also includes any dog with characteristics similar to any of those dogs. So it casts um, a wide web regarding uh, our canine friends. If a dog isn't a purebred dog, it's a mixed dog. And they call almost every short-haired, medium-sized dog a pit bull. Even the professionals say that they get it wrong 75% of the time when DNA is compared to what they thought it was. The words pit bull, these days I try not to use them anymore. When I first started out, um, it was definitely a learning process for me to learn the damage that those words do. Those words, I cannot express enough, literally cost dogs their lives, particularly in shelters. There's a huge misconception and public fear with the term for those who are not better informed. Um, my message to people all the time is not to use the words because all dogs are such individuals. I mean, any dog um, is capable of attacking somebody and hurting someone, from a chihuahua to a, a mastiff. Obviously, the bigger the dog, the more damage they can do, but every dog is capable of this. Well, a lot of it has to do with the owner. A dog's behavior is what they're trained to do or trained not to do. That is on the owner. So why would you go after the breed? Why don't you, you know, lay the responsibility for the, your dog's action on the owner? And quite frankly, the way all of our animal legislation, such as it is, it is in this province, um, sees animals as the property of their owner. Now we may have, you know, and I have some problems with that, that animals are not sentient beings at their property, but be that as it may, if their property, then the responsibility for the property lies with the owner. It's not with the property, 
you know, I mean, if you use, you know, if I, if I use this to hit somebody over the head with, it's not this is this problem, it's my problem. Since BSL has been put in Ontario, dog bites have not decreased. And yet, how many dogs have lost their lives for no reason? Innocent dogs. How many wonderful families have had their dogs seized for no reason? I mean, it's just ridiculous. If you're worried about the damage a breed of dog can cause, then you would have to look at all large breed dogs. And body weight would be more of an issue than breed, because anything that's heavier, that's stronger, just by definition, strength can do more damage. The problem with this is you get rid of one breed, and then you have a 120 pound German Shepherd who decides to attack somebody your community is not safer. So breed-specific legislation where it really fails to do what it's set out to do, which is make communities safer, is it nowhere does it talk about education. Nowhere does it talk about o owner um, responsibility. So any animal under poor ownership or wrong ownership can be potentially dangerous, whether it be to another animal, to oneself, or to another person. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what the breed is. You know, when a child gets uh, attacked by an alligator in Florida at a Disneyland, we don't all of a sudden decide that alligators are no longer protected species and we're going to just get, make sure they're all gone. Because obviously another accident can happen. If you live in BC or if you live in Calgary, if you live somewhere else, and you live around urban wildlife, if there's a, a hiker on a trail and all of a sudden they get attacked by a black bear or a cougar or something happens, we don't go out and hunt all the black bears or all the cougars in the area because there's always the possibility of something happening. What we do is we look in all those situations and all those examples is we talk about context. We look at the situation specifically, what happened, what might have provoked the situation, what might have caused the situation. Was there any human error involved in that situation? Was there any provocation? There's always a context. Nobody wants to see a child hurt by a dog. Nobody. And as heartbreaking as that is for the parents and anyone else, we also have to be preventative. And I think, again, parents, if they're going to take the responsibility of having a dog, they also need to take the responsibility of the supervision and, um, and also educating the child. Nobody wants an incident, nobody. And my heart goes out to anyone who, who's gone through such a terrible ordeal. It's the same thing as a, a child falling into a pool. Um, it's, it's something you can't take back. It's heartbreaking. They have to live with this. And um, I don't know what to say. We certainly feel very badly when anything like this happens, and we work hard to educate the public that it doesn't happen. Ownership and responsibility when it comes to dogs is when you're with your animal, you are 100% with your animal, and you are dedicating your attention to the animal and you. You are not bringing the animal as an accessory around to leave in your car because you have to do groceries or because you want to go buy a pack of smoke so you think it's okay to tie your dog up to a pole in public outside unattended. That's not responsible ownership. Responsible ownership is treating an animal like a member of the family, like a living, breathing animal, sentient being that deserves just as much attention as any other sentient being. In terms of alternatives to BSL, we have always advocated that we need better animal legislation. But the emphasis has to be on the owner, not on the dog. I mean, it's the owner's fault if they use their dog as a weapon. It doesn't matter whether it's a chihuahua or whether it's you know a mastiff. Uh, it's the owner's fault. It's lack of training. It's la lack of education in our schools as well. Um, Calgary is kind of the gold standard in Canada for how to do it well. And what do they do there? They have huge fines for bad owners. Um, they have education programs in the schools where children understand and are, are taught. You know, how do you approach a strange dog? Do you just walk up to a, a dog willy-nilly? You pull a dog's tail? You know, all of this is necessary to prevent attacks, especially upon children who are the most vulnerable. And we need to realize that dogs aren't the problem, humans are.
the bottom line is that dogs should be treated as individuals and not targeted based on anything, most especially their appearance, because that has absolutely no bearing on the way that they behave nor on their personality. Every single dog should be treated as an individual and that is exactly what Calgary's model runs by and that's exactly the opposite of what BSL runs by. And I think just the registration numbers alone in Calgary prove that it is effective in Calgary versus Toronto. And also as far as uh, dog incidents with dogs, in the year 1995, Calgary had reported 2,000 dog incidents. So whether those were bites or attacks, but uh, in the year 2014, that number had gone down to 641, which is the time in which the dog responsible dog ownership model had come into play. And you also have to keep in mind there's a drastic increase in population in that time as well, so I think it's pretty clear that that is a very effective model. In the city of Chattagui, where for 27 years we had the strictest breed ban in the world, it was actually shoot on site policy here. And we, uh, it, was, it came in in the 90s, uh, and we're a suburb of Montreal. One day I'm standing outside of a corner store when uh, waiting for uh, my family to come back out. I'm standing outside waiting uh, with the dog, and uh, all of a sudden a police officer came up and says, well, you have seven days to get rid of your dog, and really I'm doing you a favor because I could shoot the dog right now. At the time, Murphy was 10 years old and he always lived at the same address, uh, never a complaint from neighbors or anything like that. Uh, finally, the police officer left and immediately I began the Pitbull Association of Chattagui because I knew that Murphy was not alone in Chattagui. There was, there was other families in the same situation. Right away, uh, the pack started uh, uh, collecting stories of things that happened in Chattagui, like atrocious stories, like, like dogs being shot in front of entire families. And that's, that's, that's a big part of it. A lot of people like look at this issue that don't know much about it and they think this is about dogs, but really it's about families. One of the first myths that a lot of people still believe is that, is that pit bulls have locking jaws. It makes absolutely no sense to believe that any any dog has a has a jaw that locks at what at here or here or here like where does it lock it makes no sense another myth is that their jaws are stronger than any other dog a pit bull has no more of a powerful jaw than any other dog his size you know they have a big beautiful smile but their jaws are no more powerful than any other dogs. And as a matter of fact, they lost to the German Shepherd and the, and the Roddy in, in that test. So another myth is that they, they have um, aggression bred into them somehow, these dogs. And when, when breeders talk about that a dog was bred for this purpose or that purpose, they're not talking about the dog's brain. They're talking about the physical attributes which lend to that dog performing a certain function. That's it. The tendencies of the dog have nothing to do with breed. The dogs are all individuals. You can, you can breed two of the most aggressive dogs and they'll all have like super sweet puppies, you know? There was an extremely tragic incident that took place a couple of years ago where a woman lost her life due to a dog attack that happened. What people neglected to discuss at the time before making these decisions were the factors in the context again around what happened. Not long ago, the coroner released a report uh, and uh, their assessments of what happened in the, uh, the case of this, this woman. The conclusions in this coroner's report are that breed w was not the factor in this accident that happened. What was a factor was the dog's behavior, which was a result of negligence by the owner over a long period of time. And another more important factor that comes out in this report is that this was preventable. This accident should have never happened. This woman should be alive today and should not have ever lost her life due to this, this, this situation. And the reason I say that is because this animal had been involved in numerous bitings. 
Specifically, the second time it had bit, it had sent somebody to the hospital with a fractured arm and severe lacerations, and another person with a bite to the, to the leg. The police came, they intervened. There were hospital reports. The city intervened, but there was no follow-up. Had the city sent an inspector to seize the animal, make sure it goes to an evaluation with animal experts, they would have caught this problem before it ever became a danger publicly. In my opinion, the only reason that this ever happened in Montreal and while we're talking about BSL is because the city neglected to enforce a bylaw at the time that was in place that enabled us and permitted us to intervene to protect the public, to make sure that we have a safe community. And because the city neglected to do their work, it resulted in someone's death and it resulted in panic policy making by the current administration of the city and the mayor of the city. So many people like me just have mutts. Like they're not pit bulls, they're not Staffordshire Terriers, they're not Staffordshire Bull Terriers. Found them on the street. They're mutts. They have some bully breed. It could be Bull Mastiff, it could be Bull Terrier, it could be any number of dogs. It could be no bully breeds and just the combination of genetics makes them look this way. So they set up these ID clinics. They had absolutely no idea what they were doing at all. Um, at the first ones my friends went to, when they asked like what characteristics they were looking at or what they were measuring, they said it was like a ongoing list in development. So they were making it up as they went along. So the city expert and their independent consultant, who's also supposed to be a dog expert, both said that they can't ID breeds off looks. And that's exactly what they were there to do. The day they announced BSL in Montreal was the worst day of my life. I was convinced I was losing my puppy. I started having anxiety attacks every morning, every night. About um, seven years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, made me stop working. Um, really, I felt like my world was ending. And then I met Boomer. We went and we rescued Boomer and brought him home. And ever since anxiety calmed down, my depression's a lot better. The guy saved my life, basically. My financial situation right now is what you call above poverty line. Um, I'm not working right now. I am on welfare. It's something that I'm working on. Uh, my anxiety keeps me at home and Boomer keeps me sane. So we're working on it. And as long as I can keep Boomer, basically, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good road. The day after they decided to have BSL in Montreal, um, we went to the city hall here in Villa Salle and we got our first beat. It's $150, that's just to start your demand. You don't get a reimbursement if they decide to not give it to you. You lost your $150. Then you had to get him neutered. Then I had to get him vaccinations. Some of it is normal, but in one month like that, to, to, to just look into somebody's pocket and expect $1,000, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. So it was uh, very stressful for everybody. I'm a little ashamed of doing this, but I want to keep my dog, so I'm going to do whatever, it is, whatever I need to do to keep my dog. So I set up the GoFundMe, started getting donations from people I never expected to get donations from. We asked for $420, which was our goal. Uh, it wasn't going to cover everything, but I didn't want to ask for too much money either. Uh, we collected $315 out of $420 in about 40 hours, which was incredible. It helped us pay for the $150 to start everything with Boomer. Then we got um, the appointment at the, the SPCA, the, the, the vet clinic, uh, was about two weeks after that, so it was another $200. I didn't have that money, and um, thank God, like GoFundMe, everybody helped out. Uh, so I was able to keep Boomer. Since BSL is in, is in state here, basically, um, going for a walk, just going for a walk with Boomer's help. Wake up in the morning, you know, the, the puppy shuffle when they have to go, you know, right now. Well, there's no more right now. Now you gotta put the harness, then you gotta put the muzzle. It took me about, I'd say two months for him to get used to the muzzle, and he still doesn't like it. He really still doesn't like the muzzle. He, I don't think he'll ever get used to it. 
During the day, I go outside in the backyard where he needs his muzzle because my fence is not big enough. So there's no playing for him. Always the muzzle. Um, it's not fair. It's not fair for us. It's not fair for the dogs. Um, I want to play with my dog. I don't get to play with Boomer anymore. Uh, he used to love to play ball. Now he has a muzzle. It's no fun for him. It's no fun for me either, you know? But that's the stigma of the pit bull. And that's what we're trying to change, right? They had no clue when they decided to include BSL into this bylaw. They had no clue about any of the work that had been done or any of the statistics or information that had been gathered over the last 20 years in places where BSL was already enacted and had been proven completely ineffective. If the city really had no clue before doing this, and refuse to listen to experts or refuse to look at reports or statistics that clearly identify the errors in BSL, then ultimately this city has not done anything to make our communities safer. If anything, they're creating a false sense of security and they've made our communities more dangerous. We've got the Montreal election coming up and that is our best hope right now to get rid of uh, uh, breed specific legislation because it is the co their administration that is, has enacted it in Montreal without consulting any experts or considering what the people protesting outside are saying. His decision to do that has affected animal welfare all over the province. And now we have Bill 128, a provincial bill to ban these dogs coming in. And we believe that if, this, if he wins this election and stays in, it, it'll, it'll look to the Quebec government like the, like the population is for BSL. The other option is Valerie Plant. Uh, she's amazing. The first thing she's going to do is repeal BSL. And then once it's out in Montreal, that will send a message to the province that they will not be successful with Bill 128 and the backlash from them trying to pass BSL province-wide in Quebec will not be worth whatever they think they're gaining out of passing an ineffective, costly, and discriminatory law that just diminishes the life of the people it affects. It all started from a complaint that was put in the city and uh, the police officers saying that I was, my dogs were nuisance. And uh, the cops came over to advise me that uh, there was a complaint and that I had seven days to get rid of my dogs because I have six dogs at home. And I could tell you that most of the neighbors did not even know I had six dogs. That's how quiet they were. I mean, dogs bark when, once in a while. But no one knew I had six dogs. And um, he told me I had seven days to get rid of my dogs because I was illegal. And I told him I wouldn't accept it. He wanted to come into the house and I didn't want to. So it started off pretty bad. And after that, well, uh, we went out for a walk one night because we, walk, we used to walk every night with the dogs, three times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night so he could be able to relax because Marc-André is autistic, uh, doesn't talk very much, and is pretty afraid of a lot of things, but the dogs reassure him, so, and it, was, it helped us for him to sleep at night because Marc-André sleeps about three hours a night. So when we used to walk the dogs, it was uh, fantastic. But since we had that complaint and that officer that came over and gave me seven days to get rid of the dog, he started harassing us, following us around. And uh, one day he came up to us and we were walking and he told me that um, um, we had a type pit bull and told me that too was illegal and that he would shoot my dog. So he scared Marc-André, and I thought he wasn't serious at the beginning. You know, I said, okay, he just wants to show that he, you know, he has power over us. When he put his hand on the holster, uh, he started screaming because he knows what it, you know, he knows what a gun is, and he used to love the police, so he had a gun, he had the, the badge, he had everything. And when he 
I saw him put the hand on the holster. I said, whoa, you know, I said, uh, he's autistic. So I told him, uh, I told him he couldn't threaten us like that. And he, he came forward again. And that's when I picked up the dog and I put the dog between me and Marc-André. So Marc-André, like I was standing, I had the dog in the back and Marc-André was holding her. So we were able to walk. And so he couldn't shoot her, you know, because I wasn't sure if he was going to do it or not. So finally I walked off and he kept on talking to me, but we kept on walking and I told him, you're scaring my son, I'm going back home. So we went back home. I got in the house, I cried and I cried and I was shaking and he, he threw himself on the floor and I had for four hours of him shaking and crying and screaming and wanting us to lock the doors and he was afraid of the police. He didn't want to take the dogs out no more. So uh, it really, it was really um, stressful and very upsetting to see that you just walk around with a dog and the cop could come up and tell you he's going to shoot your dog because of the way he looks. For a week, I did not go out. Marc-André did not want to go for his walks. I didn't want to take a chance either. So after a week, I told Marc-André, we have to go for the walk. So instead of going out with my tip, pit bull type dog, I, still, I went out with the labs because I have Labradors too. We went out for the walk that night and uh, it was the last one. We never went walking after that because the neighbors saw that the cops were around the house a lot and the accident with Madame Vadnet happened. And now the neighbors were saying that uh, I had two dangerous people. I had my dog that was a dangerous dog and my son, because since my son is handicapped and he doesn't talk very well and he, he has sometimes, you know, the way he, he acts is different from other people, you know? So they started screaming things like that at us, that uh, I should have them both uh, put to sleep. We were throwing rocks and um, he came home with a big uh, gash on his head because he got the rock on the head. And I was disgusted by that. And again, I cried and he cried. And then he told me, he, to he said to me, uh, I'm sad, mommy. And why don't they like my dog? And at the beginning, when I started living this with Marc-André, I thought I was alone. I mean, I was desperate. I was uh, sorry. I thought I'd lose the dogs and I thought I'd lose my son because if I didn't have my dogs. Sorry. If I didn't have my dogs, I couldn't have kept my son because my dogs have a, a, a good bond with Marc Andre. Uh, they take care of him. I haven't had to go to the hospital in four years because Marc-André used to hurt himself. And I told myself, I can't believe I'm the only one living this. And finally, someone I met told me, well, you know, there's a guy I heard about in Chateaugui that's going through the same thing you are. And the next day she called me saying, you, did you see in the Soleil, they're having a protest at the city hall, you should go, go find out what you can do. And that's how I met Hugh. I went, I met Murphy the same time. And I've been fighting this with Hugh since, uh, I could say July, 2015. And for Marc-André, Hugh is like, a superhero, you know? He knows that when we go see Hugh, it's because we're saving his dogs. One of the main things that we have to take into consideration is breed-specific legislation can affect any large breed type of dog. So animal owners have to understand that this isn't just about someone else's dog or someone else. This is about you, and this can affect you if governments choose to include your breed, your dog, in this type of legislation. What our responsibility is, is to make sure that we share all the information with people and as much information as possible so that people can arrive at an educated conclusion on what the best measures would be to actually make communities safer, which don't include breed-specific legislation. People are not being active enough. People are being complacent. Like, we set up protests and marches. We were trying to have protests almost every month, the days that they had the city council votes. 
and it's the same 20, 30 people every single time. But last year, when all of this was the hot topic and the trendy thing to be active about, we had 1,500 people at two of the marches. A lot of people don't think politics matters in their lives. It matters a lot, as we so learned. So we need to be asking leaders what their position is on this, even in areas that don't have BSL currently. The tools are there to, so that children and people don't get hurt. But and they're that, not being utilized by media. Yeah. They're not getting out there. And that is why people have to do their own research. And, and, and we really appreciate advocates who will turn around and if they, if they ask a question and they find the answer, that they use social media and they get this information out there. They repost, they share our posts, we share other people's posts. And it is using Twitter, it is using Instagram, it is using Facebook, it's using anything you can to educate the public because the resource materials are out there. We just have to find it and then let the advocates go out and post and post. They have hundreds of friends and it's about that, it's, it's getting the information out there. We want to see people better educated. We want public safety when it comes to dogs. We just don't think it's going to work targeting people like us and, and a specific look that a dog has. It's not going to improve public safety. Get into the schools. Teach four-year-olds to eight-year-olds how to responsibly be around dogs. Um, teach them animal behavior. And you'll see dog bites drop. And as for me, I just want to take my certified canine good neighbor and have a really nice walk in the park without being hassled by people. My community involvement over the last 11 years has been, you know, it's been such an honor and a privilege to, to represent folk um, both in Parkdale High Park but across Ontario on various issues. So I've passed more private members' bills than anybody in Ontario's history, done that by working with the other parties, and I've passed more LGBTQ legislation than anybody in Canada's history. You know, we've done a whole lot out of this office and I'm so proud of that. So it's been a privilege, it's been a, a pleasure and just know that of all of these issues, they were all climbing up the hill. You know, they weren't easy, um, but we got them done because we kept on keeping on. So keep on keeping on for something that you hold dear. And uh, I always say to all stakeholders, there's no question you will win. The only question is when. BSL is bullshit. BSL is bullshit. BSL is absolute bullshit. BSL is 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 bullshit.